I think we'll make a start now as almost everybody has logged on. So a very warm welcome to this week's UCL Rare Books Club. And as some of you already know, ordinarily we would be meeting in our special collections reading room at UCL and we would be poring over some physical rare books. But of course, that's not possible at the moment. So we have gone online and this is our third session in the series. Um, this series is ordinarily very informal and we aim to show some of our collections at UCL of uh, rare books and manuscripts and archives. And we also aim to have a little bit of a conversation going. Now, that's a really difficult thing to achieve with this online webinar software. But I hope after the talks today, we'll be able to have some questions and a bit of a discussion. So just a bit of housekeeping. If for any reason you get thrown off this session because your Wi-Fi signal drops or anything like that, you can just rejoin using the same link. And you should be able to rejoin any time up until the end of the session. The second thing is that we have two fantastic moderators behind the scenes and they will be helping you um, if you have any difficulties um, and in the question session, they'll be helping you to unmute yourself if you want to speak and ask questions. We are going to be recording this session. So if you'd like to stay anonymous, do keep your video switched off and stay muted and you'll find the symbols for those two functions at the bottom of the screen. There's a little microphone which is the second symbol you'll see and you can click that to mute yourself and there's a sort of horizontal video symbol and you can click that to mute yourself as well. And finally, you probably read from the slide when you joined, if you joined um, a little while ago, when we show slides at the top left, there's a little uh, magnifying glass symbol. And you can click on that to expand the view of the slides yourself if you're watching on a small screen. And that's often really helpful. I know my screen is very small and it can be quite hard to read text on the slides. Um, so without more ado, I'm going to introduce our speakers today. Now, this year is particularly tough on our students who are graduating. And at UCL, we have a, an MA in Library and Information Studies which is the module that many people aiming to become rare books librarians or to gain more skills are going to be following. So uh, we heard from one of those students last week as the winner of the Anthony Davis Book Collecting Prize. By chance, she happened to be from this course. Today, I've programmed two more students. They are MA students and they're going to be presenting as librarians but they're going to be presenting about false imprints in the Netherlands during the late 1600s. And I hope that there will be people in the audience today who have that expertise in Dutch studies and possibly in uh, Spinoza, the author of that uh, one of the speakers is going to be talking about, and uh, French literature and also Milton, I think, that the second speaker is going to be talking about. So uh, first of all, uh, please understand that these are ME students. They're speaking bibliographically rather than with the historical knowledge. But secondly, please do, after both speakers, we're going to have a question and answer session. Please do um, speak up if you have any extra knowledge from your historical or literary backgrounds that might help the speakers. We're going to start today with Will Rennie and he's going to talk about false imprints in uh, the 
uh, philosopher Spinoza um, around the time of his death, just before and just after. Um, so I'm going to hand you over to Will now. Meanwhile, moderators with their virtual roaming mics are <laughs> to try to get uh, Will's um, slides and voice up and running. Thank you, Will. All right. Uh, thanks, Tabitha. Hey, everyone. I'm Will. Um, as Tabitha mentioned, I'm a final year student on the Library and Information Studies MA at UCL. Um, I'm also an assistant librarian at the National Poetry Library. Um, and yeah, it's really nice to get an opportunity to discuss one of my favourite writers, actually, Spinoza, uh, and to actually sort of get to do a deep dive into his kind of, you know, the more historical aspects of uh, his published work. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with Spinoza, he was um, a Jewish philosopher um, based in Holland uh, in the 17th century, um, was sort of quite controversial in, it, uh, in his time, he was sort of excommunicated from the synagogue and um, yeah, uh, a lot, you know, raised, raised a lot of hell um, with his quite radical rationalist ideas. Um, so yeah, we're going to have a look at these now, so I'm just going to share these slides. So yeah, Boldface Liars, Religious Censorship and a Book Forged in Hell. Cool. So um, I'll start in September 1675. Um, Spinoza writes a letter to his friend um, Oldenburg in England. Um, this is following the controversy surrounding one of his works, the Tractatus Theologico Politicus, which we'll talk about in great detail in a moment. Um, and that was a book where he sort of tried to separate church and state, basically. Um, uh, so at that time, um, it provoked a fierce reaction from religious institutions. And he said, um, a rumour became widespread following these books that a certain book of mine about God was in the press and that in it I endeavour to show that there is no God. Due to the um, controversy caused by the Tractatus, he decided to postpone the publication to see how matters turned out. Two years later, in 1677, shortly after his death, um, his posthumous works emerged and these included the ethics that he was talking about. Um, so this sort of radically controversial book got published just after his death. Um, only two editions of this book appeared, uh, one in Latin and one in Dutch, uh, and they did sort of show that he was the author in a manner of speaking. Uh, and this came as quite a surprise after the publication history of the Tractatus Theologico Politicus, because that was a book that had multiple different editions over the course of seven years. There was a lot of sort of subdiffuse and deception um, while publishing this book and trying to sort of disseminate it. So what I'm interested in is um, why there are so many sort of editions of this one book and then an arguably more controversial book was uh, published shortly afterwards and the sort of publication history seems a little bit more straightforward. So we're going to have a look. Um, so the Tractatus Theologico Politicus, um, so Nadler in his book, A Book Forged in Hell, which is, I really recommend if you're interested in this kind of thing, um, describes it as a book that denied the divinity of the Bible, ruled out the possibility of miracles, identified God's providence with the laws of nature, deflated the revelations of the prophets and reduced religion to a simple moral code. So it upset a lot of the Jewish religious authorities at the time. Um, they saw that it might sort of reduce their influence on uh, the affairs of the government and the state if um, people were able to sort of read this. So the publisher, Jan Ruverts, uh, forgive me if that's the wrong pronunciation, um, the publisher who published the book made great efforts to evade censorship of the book. Every, sort of everyone involved knew that this was gonna be quite a controversial um, publication. So yeah, they, uh, as you'll see, they made a lot of efforts to kind of make sure that this got out to the public. So I've used some terms, T1, T2, etc. Um, these are all taken from, um, I think it's Bandenberg's bibliography of the Tractatus. Bamberger, sorry, um, which is worth checking out. Um, so as you can see, T1, this is a picture of the title page. 
it looks quite straightforward. The title of the book is there and everything. Uh, but if you look closely, you'll see that no authorship is given. So you can't tell anywhere that it's by Spinoza. And then instead of Jan Rivert, uh, the publisher's name, uh, you can see right at the bottom there that says Henrikum Kunrat. And the, uh, the publication location is Hamburg instead of Amsterdam. So already you can see the effort is being made to sort of keep, keep these things secret, to sort of um, conceal the identity of what's going on here. Um, so that's the first edition. A second edition emerged two years later. So you can see the title page is pretty much identical, but the date reads differently. So you've got um, 1672 at the bottom, 1670. Um, the edition itself has some sort of minor revisions. There are some sort of uh, errata that were changed, um, some different page numbers and stuff. I can't remember the specifics exactly, but it was a different edition to T1. But um, they clearly became a bit uh, wary of this, um, publishing a different edition. Um, so shortly after this one was published, T2A appeared, and the date was changed back to 1670, making the title page identical to T1. So the contents of this edition were still different to T1, um, but the title page sort of looked the same. So it seemed as though they were trying to make it look like a second edition was never published. The date remained the same. Um, so you can see they're being super cautious. Um, the date change may have been a reaction to the assassination of Johan de Witt, who was the, I believe he was the ruler of Holland at the time. I, apologies, my, my Dutch history is, is very shaky, and it feels like if any of you have sort of comments or questions at the end, they could be really useful to sort of frame the context of this a bit better. But Johan de Witt, um, from what I gather, is was a, a large advocate of free speech and free, uh, free thought and stuff. So when he was assassinated, there was a kind of real cautious approach to all these things because it seemed like there was a kind of more strict political thing on the horizon. So then after T2, you have all of these T3 editions. So the, the, uh, the deceptions become much more extreme. Um, a lot of the details on the title pages become extremely fictitious. Uh, and don't resemble what we've just seen at all. So here's a few examples. So here's all the examples. Uh, <laughs> um, so you've got a sort of medical textbook by a doctor called Via Corta, um, published by Jacobin Pauli. Um, then one of them was published as um, a historical collection by Danielis Hainsey. Then you have another medical textbook by Francisci de la Beau Silvi. Again, apologies for my pronunciation. Um, so you can see that they just kind of absolutely go with the, um, let's just put these fake books out and, uh, you know, keep it a secret that we're making these. Um, but the reaction from the authorities um, was, um, you know, I think, I think this, this actually made them more obviously deceptive and that raised a lot of alarm bells for authorities. So you can see this other third edition here on the right. Um, it seemed like this title page was drawn up for publication in England. Um, so the, uh, we could shift all of these copies of the Tractatus that were sort of, the authorities were starting to get a bit more um, alert to. So you can see they've made great efforts just to sort of make these uh, Apologies if I'm rushing through these slides as well, uh, but hopefully they'll be made available afterwards so you can have a closer look at the title pages because they're all really interesting, I think. Um, then after the T3s, we see the emergence of T4 and T5, um, both of which I think have the same title page, but this is the title page for T4, I think, that's displayed here. I should have written that. Um, so again, this looks extremely similar to T1. But if you look really closely at the very bottom, um, the name of the publisher reads Henrikum Kuhn uh, Rath as opposed to Henrikum Kuhn Rath. So there's obviously a difference here between this and the first edition. Um, and uh, one writer on this called Land, he suggests that these were actually published in 1677, uh, despite the 1670 date displayed here, which again ties in with them sort of trying to make it look like no new editions have appeared, um, but the, the differences are there. And uh, yeah, they're clearly just uh, making an effort to, to subvert. <laughs> um, yeah, which I, I don't know, I just think it's the idea of them uh, all gathered in the, I don't know, yeah, the idea of this Jan Rupert's character just kind of like thinking of ways to deceive the authorities, I think is quite cool. Um, 
So in terms of the translation, there's no Dutch vernacular, vernacular translation of the Tractatus uh, until 1693. So obviously there's a massive gap. There was the Latin and then um, it just got shut down basically. Uh, and in the words of Nadler, a vernacular edition capable of spreading his subversive and impious ideas to the masses would surely inflame the authorities beyond even their current fever pitch. So obviously there was a wariness about translating this already controversial um, piece of work. Which brings us to the posthumous works. So after uh, the Tractatus, this is uh, 1677, after the Tractatus, a book that reduced religion to a simple moral code caused an uproar. It's understandable in the letter that we just saw that Spinoza would have um, been hesitant or cautious with publishing a book that rumored to show that there is no God at all, um, in inverted commas. Um, so Spinoza entrusted the posthumous publication of his principal works, including this controversial ethical with his friends. So in 1677, just after his death, these posthumous works were published uh, both in, well, first in Latin and then very shortly afterwards, uh, a Dutch edition appeared. So this is quite surprising in itself. So here are the title pages for those. So as you can see, kind of maximum transparency here. Jan Rieverts has still concealed his identity, but we have BDS, which uh, clearly kind of indicates that um, his initials, uh, the contents are all there, and the fact that there is a vernacular translation is quite surprising in itself. Um, so yeah, um, there was just one edition of each. There was no sort of layers of deception or anything like that. So I guess my question is, why is this so different to the Tractatus? So here he is again. Um, so the initial outcry um, about the Tractatus was largely from religious authorities. So in 1677, uh, 1670, sorry, local consistories took action against the book, uh, which then escalated to regional synods, who then took it to secular authorities. So there were a lot of sort of religious authorities in local communities trying to sort of ban the book in their own communities or try and um, you know stigmatize it or what have you. But in statewide, there was no real kind of recognition of it as a threat or anything like that. In 1671, Holland's High Court declared the Tractatus illegal, but the states of Holland did not issue an outright ban. So there was still a bit of flexibility and Jan Reverts was still able to distribute it in some capacity. In 1673, the local bans by religious authorities resulted in the evasive tactics that we saw in T2 and T3. So all of these sort of fake editions, these date changes, name changes and all of that kind of thing. And then it was this it was this kind of evasion and deception that then attracted more unwanted attention from the kind of state uh, secular authorities. So in 1974, the Tractatus was finally officially banned. So we can see through this kind of process um, of having state, you know, still being sanctioned by the same to, uh, state to publish, uh, but having local authorities kind of continually trying to shut it down. You can see this kind of interplay of there's still flexibility to publish but they've got to be inventive to make sure that people don't know what it is um, quite a kind of complicated thing to navigate but that sort of explains why there was such a proliferation of different editions when it came to the posthumous works the state's leniency had completely disappeared so in 1677 there were proposals um, to apply penalties for even owning copies of the posthumous works and then by 1678 there were finally um, some pretty heavy duty um, pretty heavy duty ordinances which just meant printing, reprinting, selling um, either of the books just meant heavy penalties so it was untenable for um, any kind of works for Spinoza to be to be published. So my speculative conclusion um, of course it is that it does have to be what kind of partly speculative um, is that Reverse was aware that there would only be one opportunity to print the posthumous works given the controversy around Spinoza's work at the time and just how much of a fierce reaction the Tractatus provoked. Um, there's a new political landscape under William of Orange, which again, some of you might know more about than I do. Um, but I got, yeah, um, there are arguments that given that he was a new authority in the country, he wanted to sort of um, make, his, make his brand known and, you know, crack down on all this stuff. So. It, uh, presumably, reverts knew it was going to be too risky to continue to print them, even if even if they were um, dis disguised um, or anything like that. Oops, sorry. Uh, bu -bu 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 -bu. Um, so yeah, 
I, I, again, this is quite speculative, but I imagine this may have made his approach bolder if he's just like, this is the one edition we're going to publish. Let's get the vernacular Dutch edition out. Uh, let's just make it clear that this is the posthumous works of Spinoza. Um, drops a good in. Um, so yeah. Um, but I just thought that the contrast between the two histories was really interesting. The kind of uh, yeah between the tractatus and the and the posthumous works, just a really kind of um, yeah sharp divide. And as a kind of um, postscript, the story continues. Um, so obviously the the censorship meant that um, at the time it was sort of unclear how well distributed the work would be, but it continued to be sort of. Um, you know, it got it got through the right channels, and it became one of the, the ethics or the ethic became one of the most important philosophical works recognised today, uh, a classic of rational thought. Um, and as my publication history continues, only this year the uh, the first English translation, which was actually written by George Eliot in 1856, uh, it only saw publication this very year. And I recommend it as a good lockdown read if any of you are still in lockdown. Um, cool, and I think. That about wraps it up. I'm sorry if I was fast or anything like that. And if anyone's interested in the slides, let me know. Uh, and there's a sort of selected bibliography here if, uh, if you're interested in any of that. All right. Fantastic. Thank you very much indeed, Will. That's a wonderful amount of information that you managed to get into a very short time that we are allocated to you. <laughs> so, yeah. um, that's great, thank you very much. So yeah. our question to the, um, it, uh, at the end of the session, to the uh, Dutch studies and the, I know we have some theologians in the audience and possibly some philosophers, um, is if you have any suggestions about what caused this real contrast between the quite elaborate attempt to disguise the publication details and the um, authorship of that first publication as Will showed. And then this real boldness um, with the posthumous work. Um, and fantastic to hear about the George Eliot translation, which I didn't know about until uh, Will told me. So that's Fantastic, thank you very much, Will. Um, our second speaker is Holly Dowd, and she is currently doing her MA dissertation on false imprints in the Netherlands, but specifically uh, used as used by the Elsevier Publishing House, one of the great publishing houses of the Netherlands in the late 1600s. Um, and Holly is going to talk about quite a range of different false imprints and I think also just going to start by explaining exactly what we mean when we talk about that in relation to the Elsevier examples that she's got um, and while she gets herself unmuted and her slides up and running I just want to introduce you to our moderators behind the scenes they're Christopher Fripp and Harriet Hale so if you get any messages from them in the chat they're trying to help you to view the screen better. Are you there, Holly? Hello. Yes, I'm. Hello. Welcome. <laughs> I'll hand over to you. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Holly. Uh, as Tabitha said, I'm just finishing up my um, library and information studies MA, and I'm also an assistant librarian at um, St Hughes in Oxford. Um, I think Tabitha did a pretty good job of introducing my topic there, so I think I will just put my slides up now and start sharing them with you. I will turn my camera off as I'm speaking, as I've had a few technical issues this morning. Um, so just in case anything goes wrong, I'm going to turn my camera off now. So this is my uh, presentation, False Imprints and Hidden Identities, a Case Study of the Elseviers. So it was during a session in our historical bibliography class that I first came across a false imprint on an early printed book. And up until that point, I've generally assumed that most imprint information on title pages is accurate. And as a cataloger, this is information that I really rely on. 
So I found it really fascinating to think that there was more to these title pages than first meets the eye. And whilst as a cataloger and librarian, I realised its impracticalities. So without realising, we could be misidentifying early printed works. So I decided to do a bit more um, detective work and have a look for some more examples of false imprints. Before we go any further, I will just give a brief um, definition of an imprint and a false imprint as appears on the title pages of these works. So as you can see on the example title page here, the imprint statement appears at the bottom of the page and tells us something about the book and the way it came into existence by providing details of the printing house, the place and the date of publication. However, as many are already aware, early printed books are not entirely reliable sources of in-print information. Many title pages house an abundant misleading or false information, such as incorrect dates of printing, fictitious places of publication, and false printers' names, whilst some just include no in-print information at all, which makes it very fun for catalogers and bibliographers. So, as has already been claimed, this means it's not always safe to take the imprint at face value, which, as I said, can present difficulties for book historians, bibliographers and librarians when trying to identify where a book has been produced. Uh, there are many reasons as to why false imprints appear on the title pages of early printed books, but the general main motivations behind their use um, is for economic and political purposes to produce and distribute copies of unauthorised or illegitimate works. So this is one example of where a false imprint has been used for such reasons. This is John Milton's Angli Pro Populo Anglicana Defensio, or John Milton, an Englishman, his defence of the people of England. So it was first printed in 1651 by William Dugard, and it's a piece of political propaganda commissioned by Parliament during Oliver Cromwell's protectorship of England as a response to a work by Claudius Salmasius, which accused Cromwell's party of regicide for executing the king. So all copies here, as we can see, have the name William Dugard as the um, printer on the imprint statement. So we'd assume that they are all printed by Dugard in London. However, the copy to the left is the original edition printed by William Dugard, and he printed only one other enlarged copy with the same title page. Despite having the same imprint information on their title pages, the two copies next to it, figures four and five, were not printed by Dugard in London, but were in fact printed by um, the Elseviers in Amsterdam, a Dutch printing family. And they weren't the only ones to reprint this text with its original imprint in place. As this quote tells us, there were many other unauthorised copies circulating at the time. Some produced in the Netherlands, some produced in France, and many different sizes and languages. So why did the Elseviers and other printers reprint the Defensio with its original imprint information instead of the actual place of printing? Before I go on any further, I'll just provide some brief historical context. So the 17th century uh, has frequently been dubbed a golden age for the Netherlands. The Dutch East India Company was founded in 1602, and its headquarters was in Amsterdam, which provided a number of international shipping channels for trading goods, while sophisticated printing technology enabled the cheap mass production of books. Furthermore, frequent trading with other countries enabled them to keep up with foreign affairs and Dutch printers were constantly on the lookout for popular, or in many cases unpopular, works. And as Dutch printers were not subject to the same restrictions as other countries, they had much more freedom to produce controversial or unauthorised works banned in other countries. However, as I already mentioned, the Dutch relied heavily on other countries for trade and therefore to avoid offending authorities or getting too involved in foreign affairs, Dutch printers often employed false imprints when producing works of a more controversial nature. Which brings us back to Milton's Defensio. 
This was a politically charged text that essentially condoned the execution of the king. And so it offended many English, French and German royalists many of whom had the book publicly burned and prohibited any production or distribution of the text in their countries. However, this only increased its popularity and many were eager to read its contents. And therefore, as we've already seen, many Dutch and French printing houses raced to produce and sell their own copies. However, again, to avoid offending foreign authorities, printers such as the Elsevier's reprinted the work with its original imprint in place. So this brings us to the Elseviers. Who were the Elseviers? Well, they were one of the most well-established printing families in the 17th century Netherlands, with printing houses in Leiden, Amsterdam, The Hague and Utrecht. The business was founded by Louis Elsevier in 1580, who began working as a bookbinder for the University of Leiden and subsequently as the university's chief bookseller and printer. Here, Louis developed a reputation for specialising in books for the learned, whilst building a strong network of foreign contacts that greatly contributed to the later success of the business. Following his death, the Leiden branch passed down to Bonaventure and Abraham Elsevier, and later to Jean Elsevier. The Amsterdam branch was set up in 1638 by Louis III, and in 1655 Daniel Elsevier joined his cousin to help run it. And from this point, Amsterdam really becomes the main print printing branch. And with no ties to the university, Louis and Daniel focused instead on producing popular works at the time, most of which were in Latin or French. However, it's also widely known that the Elseviers did occasionally produce works of a more dangerous sort, many which were banned in other countries. And in such cases, they employed false imprints to maintain anonymity. So with all of this in mind, I decided to focus my dissertation project on false imprints used in the 17th century Netherlands and more specifically on the ways in which we can go about identifying them as librarians and catalogers. Using the Elsevier Printing House as a case study, I examined three false imprints first used by the Elseviers and which then continued to be used by other printing houses throughout the 17th century. I gathered data of all early printed works with these false imprints on their title pages, recording the title and genre of works, as well as key bibliographic features on the title pages. I then closely compared the title pages of the Elsevier editions to that of other editions to show how by studying such features, we might be able to trace a work back to its original printing house. So the first false imprint that I looked at is Jean Sambix, and I just want to reiterate that this is not a real person. This is a false imprint that was first used according to the STCN by the Elseviers in 1652, and it was actively used by other printers until 1722. So on record, there are currently 67 early printed publications that have the name Jean Sambix on their title pages. Out of this 67, the Elseviers are claimed to have been responsible for 17, but the rest of the publications listed on the STCN have either no mention of the place of production or simply include a place name with a question mark next to it. So after carefully examining, examining all the Elsevier editions with this false imprint, I established some key bibliographic features used by the Elseviers on their title pages. So these are, uh, include the sphere as the printer's mark, as we can see on this um, image of the title page, and Leid, Leiden as the place of publication with a comma next to it, the consistent spelling of the name Jean Sambix, the small neat lined rule underneath the printer's name, or the false imprint's name, the inverted Roman numeral dating style followed by a full stop, and the duodecimo smaller book size. However, it's important to bear in mind that throughout the 17th century, as I've already said, many other printers were using this false imprint on title pages of other works, which makes it all the more difficult to trace these books back to their original printing houses. So my question is, 
with so many printing houses using the same false imprint, how can we tell which are the Elsevier editions and which are not? And as I've already said, one way to tell is by looking closely at the different title pages and comparing the features housed there. And a key feature that appears frequently on the Elsevier editions and is later used or borrowed by other printers is the sphere, as the printer's mark. So the first sphere on the left, on figure, uh, figure nine, uh, is a, a sphere as it appears on an Elsevier edition. So we can see that it's fairly neat, the ink distribution is consistent, the markings on the ring quite clear. And this is generally the case for all of the Elsevier editions that use the name Jean Sambix. However, when I went, uh, began to sort of look at later works that used the sphere, I did notice some discrepancies. So as we can see, figure 10 looks as though too much ink has been used, which makes the sphere appear quite blurred and, and generally just untidy and it's smudged. And the markings on the sphere can hardly be seen. According to Will Elms, a lot of later works using this false imprint were produced by a printer called F. Foppins. And as we can see from figure 11, the sphere on the title page of his works have a slight sort of glint at the top where a bit of ink is missing. And figure 12 is a very crude imitation of the sphere, which was produced uh, in 1722. So there are other ways to distinguish between these different editions. Um, some are immediately obvious, such as the change in the name. So the Elseviers use the name Jean Sambix, but this then later changes throughout the 17th century to Jean Sambix Le Jeune, and then to Jean Sambix Le Jeune à la And some are less obvious and might not be immediately noticeable, such as the size and the spacing of the type used by different printers. Other features which might seem really insignificant um, or may first go unnoticed are those such as the lined rule below the printer's name. So as we can see on figure 13, which is an Elsevier edition, the Elsevier lined rule is very small, very neat and quite consistent, whereas the lined rules on other editions are much longer, often not quite straight, and many with gaps in the ink, which would suggest that they are probably not produced by the Elseviers. So moving on to the second false imprint, uh, Jacques Lejeune. Um, I assume I'm pronouncing that right. I'm not sure what the Dutch pronounce. Uh, pronounce how the Dutch would pronounce that. So if anybody knows, then please do um, do let me know. Uh, but the name Jacques Lejeune was first used by Louis and Daniel Elsevier in 1660, but it continued to be used um, by other printers until 1696. So there are 41 publications with the name Jacques Lejeune or variations of the name, and 14 of these works are claimed to be produced by the Elseviers in Amsterdam. Daniel Elsevier is claimed to have been responsible for producing the majority of the Elsevier works. But as for the other, other works, um, we're not sure um, who was producing those. So again, I did uh, the same kind of thing as with Jean Sambix, and I identified some of the key bibliographic features on the Elsevier works using this name. And again, you can see that they use the sphere as the printer's mark. Amsterdam as the place of publication in italics, the consistent spelling of the name Jacques Lejeune, the inverted Roman numeral dating style, and the duodecimo book size. So as we can see from figure 17, the Elsevier edition spells the name Jacques Lejeune with just a Q, whilst the majority of other editions end up spelling it with a C. We can also see differences in typography with the printer's name. So on the Elsevier editions, Jacques Lejeune is all in uppercase capitals. The tail of the letter J drops quite low beneath the baseline and is generally larger than the other letters. And the tail on the Q is also very long. According to Wilhelms, many later editions were printed by somebody called Henry Wettstein. And on figure 19, we can see that his editions have less of a drop on the Q whilst the L is significantly smaller than the other letters. The letters also look slightly more spaced apart here. If we then look at figure 18 and 20, the lettering is not quite straight, and generally they just all look quite pushed together. 
As I said before, the majority of the Elsevier editions use the spear as the printer's mark for these works. It eventually comes to be associated with more controversial publications. Um, but some printers using the name Jacques Lejeune have also used a small triangular sort of floral ornament, whilst others um, have a basket of flowers. Um, and I've undertaken some brief research into this, and it does seem as though these um, more sort of floral printers' marks are used by French printers. Um, again, if anybody knows anything more about that or recognises some of these, that would be very helpful. Again, just a few more different typography with the place name. So uh, figure 22, we can see the Elsevier edition uses italics, um, whereas the Wettstein editions, as shown um, on figure 23, do not. Figure 24 um, uses italics and the letter T is a swash letter. Um, and the comma is slightly closer to the M, whilst uh, figure 25 is again slightly wonky and the printer has actually misspelled Amsterdam. It took me quite a while to notice this, um, and that just really showed to me how important this kind of close study work is, um, because such mistakes may indicate unauthorised or illegitimate printing. So thank you everyone for listening to me waffle on about um, the difference in letter sizes. Um, I know a lot of this work probably seems really pointless and quite trivial. Um, and some of you might wonder why I would spend so long doing such detailed work. Um, and honestly, at times I've also wondered that myself. <laughs> um, but such research I think is really important for catalogers, early stage librarians. Um, collection managers, acquisitions librarians who are frequently dealing with early printed works and especially for those who lack historical knowledge in a given time period or may just have not, not have the time to undergo extensive research when consulting an early printed work or, or when trying to, to um, find out how and where a book's um, been produced originally. So it's really important, I think, as well, that we're aware that imprint information on early printed books is not always accurate and that we continually question and examine the bibliographic features on these title pages. As they can reveal to us details of the book's production history, which might have otherwise remained unknown, and ignoring such features may lead us to falsely identify a book's original place of production. And not only that, but by studying these title pages carefully, we can really learn a great deal about early printing techniques and the printing styles of particular printing houses, like the Elseviers, operating in particular places, like in the Netherlands, which I think in turn, in turn could really um, help with the future identification of early printed texts. So thank you all for listening to me drone on, um, and I welcome any questions. And uh, there's my list of figures and bibliography. So thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Holly. Uh, you certainly weren't waffling. That was incredibly coherent and um, extremely interesting. Um, so I know some people have to rush off. So just before you do, um, I'm just going to switch my video off because my connection is dipping a little bit. OK, I hope you can hear me now. Just before you do, if anybody has to leave now, um, we have a feedback form which uh, Chris and Harriet will add the link to in the chat. Now, uh, if you have any questions, at the bottom of the screen, there's a little icon of a person raising their hand up. You can click that and our moderators will um, keep an eye on that for you. Um, but first of all, I know that we are very lucky to have the curator of Dutch materials from the British Library, who's incredibly kindly joined us, rushing from one meeting to this. Um, and she has a really lovely story about the Spinoza that Will was talking about. So, um, Matja Kinga, I don't know if you're there and if you can hear, but if you are, would you be happy to tell your story? We'll just wait for the moderators to get the microphone to you. 
Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Uh, hello, Tabitha, and um, hello, Will, and hello, uh, Holly. Thank you, thank you very much for uh, for wonderful um, uh, presentations. Uh, even though I've been in post for nearly 10 years at the British Library and I'm a trained librarian, uh, I always learn new things, um, even, even today. So um, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, yes, I was, um, I couldn't resist really asking Tabita if I could tell you a little anecdote about my first few weeks, really, uh, at the British Library as curator for Dutch collections when I was asked by the head of Early Printed Works to come and collect uh, an item that he'd had in his in his cupboard and that um, I really should take over from him. So I went down to his office and to my surprise, he handed me a very early print of the Tractatus Politicus of uh, 1670. And uh, it was even a very, a very early print in that um, there is a mistake made in the pagination. So page 104 is, um, is typed as, as uh, page 304. Uh, and the later print runs um, that was corrected. So this was a very, very early uh, copy. And I remember distinctly walking through uh, the building. Oh yeah, I forgot to say that Spinoza you know, it's one of my um, it's my favorite philosophers. Always has been during my studies. So uh, I was particularly pleased to uh, to be able to um, to receive this this copy. And I remember walking through the building, thinking, "I'm carrying an original copy of the Tractatus Politicus here." I I just couldn't believe it. Well, over time, you get used to these things. So um, um, you know, I've handled many, many copies of old books, but um, yeah, it's still, um, it's still is a thrill to, um, uh, to do this. So this was just something that I wanted to, to mention. Um, and now you know that we have this copy in our collection and it is um, uh, available for use. Unfortunately, it's not been uh, digitized, uh, but I'll, uh, I'll look into ways of, of, of making that happen in, in the near future. Um, so, um, yes, thanks, thanks again very much and um, best of luck with your further studies. Thank you so much, Mate. That's a wonderful story. Mate, just before we go to the next question, would you just like to say what the imprint is of that copy? Of, of well, that, that is uh, Hamburg and, um, you know, uh, it is a false imprint and it is... Um, Hamburg with um, Kuhn, what's, um, Kunrad, Kunrad, yes. Um, Fantastic, thank you. That's wonderful, Marta. Thank you so much. Sorry to put you on the spot there, but it's just it's just so nice to to hear your story and that excitement okay. when you do first handle one of your favourite works in the first edition, original edition, um, is a wonderful thing. And I'm just very sorry that we're not able to offer that at the moment with our online Rare Books Club, but uh, we shall do very soon. Now, we've got a question from Simon Marnie, um, and the um, moderators will just, uh, there you go, they've just uh, enabled you to ask your question, Simon. Oh, thank you, Tabitha. I've just switched it on. Oh, I'll put on my camera as well. I don't know if that'll allow it or not. Um, thank you. Um, thanks camera to both. Sorry, is fine okay? as well if... Camera is fine as well if you want to do that. Uh, okay. I think I think my camera's I think my camera's on. I don't know. Hi, Tabitha. Lovely to see you. Um, uh, thanks both to Will and to Holly for a great pair of presentations. And like the uh, previous. Um, uh, person. I, I love to come along to these seminars about things I don't know anything about, so I will learn something new, which I think is always a big um, uh, uh, point for all of these. But I have two very, very brief questions, one for each of the speakers. So if I, if I just leave the questions with you, and then they can answer um, individually or, or as, as you organize. But for Will, 
Yeah, all those different copies and quite rightly you've had to have a speculative um, explanation of what's going on there. But I, I wondered if we actually had any other evidence, any evidence from, uh, for instance, the publishers. I'm thinking about letters um, or other documents giving some explanation of why they've done what it is that they've done. That's for Will and for Holly. Fake news, great. False imprints. I'm, I'm wondering uh, two things. One, one whether there's any profit motivation for for these um, fake imprints. I mean, are, are these valuable volumes that'll generate a large amount of income or not? Is there some other motivation? But also for the identification, again, please excuse my ignorance, but I'm assuming that these are printed on paper. And if these are printed on paper, do they have uh, watermarks and uh, to enable you to help identify the um, original uh, manufacturer of the paper, which may help because I would assume that the printers would have, you know, specific dedicated suppliers. And also with the, the with the, um, with the watermarks, also the actual construction of the paper within the frames itself leaves those marked impressions on the different layers within the in the paper. Okay, thank you very much, and uh, great to hear from you. Lovely, thanks very much, Simon, for those questions. Um, Will Rennie, do you want to answer on Spinoza first? Sure. Yeah. Thanks for the question, Simon. That's a really good one. Um, yeah, I I do think there is. I think there is more, I, I, I have to admit that the scope of the research that I did was like quite limited, largely because um, access <laughs> access to libraries became quite limited while um, in the middle of doing it. Um, there was, I'm just trying to find it now, but um, I know that there is a kind of a bibli like a bibliographic study specifically of, of the ethics. Um, which does exist somewhere. I think it's written in German and not available online. Um, and that wasn't, I, I think there would probably be more potential answers in there. And I feel like um, Spinoza's letters would also be a good source um, of information as well. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, the kind of accessibility of these things, um, I don't know. I, th I, think there are, I think there is more, <laughs> more work to be done in like looking looking at this but if it does feel like um sort of most bibliographers are sort of looking more it seems like there's more interest around the tractatus um so in terms of work published in english and like available online um there, were, there wasn't much by way of sort of research about the decisions made behind like the the posthumous works and uh, i think another interesting area of study would actually be just Jan Reverts himself. I think he was like had a reputation as a radical publisher, and I think that would be like a really interesting thing to look at. It's just him as a, as a character as well. I think that would be like a really rich, rich ground for sort of seeing the operations of someone like that. Yeah, great. Thank you. This goes at the end of your dissertation where you have future future development of the study. You know, this will be significantly <laughs> advanced. Were I able to do these things just to show that you thought about it? So well done great. for that. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Great, thanks very much, Will. I mean, actually, um, as I understand it, there's a very interesting situation with the posthumous works where the um, manuscript tradition, not tradition, manuscript communication among his followers to produce these translations was happening at the same time as the print edition. We tend to think of manuscripts happening first and then print entirely replacing that manuscript communication. But of course that's not true, not, not true at all. So that's so that's an interesting area. And just to um uh uh step in for Will there, um Will actually did this work uh, just as an assignment coursework essay rather than your dissertation. So that's that's fantastic. I think your dissertation is on something quite different, isn't it? So Holly, now watermarks, that's a notoriously complicated issue, isn't it? Because people uh, bought up stacks of paper and then sold it on and paper moved right the way across Europe a lot. But I don't know if that's something that you've had a chance to look at. No, I mean, that's a really interesting point, actually. Um, 
and definitely something to bear in mind. I mean, at this stage, it's not something that I've really done too much research into. I've mainly just been looking at these different title pages and comparing the features on those those specific title pages with those false imprints. Um, so I, I, unfortunately, I don't know too much about about watermarks, and I haven't looked too much into that yet. Um, but definitely something to bear in mind. Great, thank you. And again, a final sentence at the end of your dissertation. But Will, if that was a coursework assignment, that's really, really outstanding. Well done. Oh, thank, thank you very much. <laughs> Appreciate that. Yes, we've got a fantastic crop of librarians coming out of this year. We just need some jobs for them at the moment. It's a difficult time, so we're showing them off to you. Um, Holly, we've got a question, well, maybe for both of you. Um, if the publication date on the title page can't be trusted due to deliberate secrecy, then how do you determine when the book actually appeared? Um, Holly, do you want to answer that first? Um, sorry, let me just get my head around that question. <laughs> if the publication date can't be trusted, how do you know when the book appeared? So how do you find out the attributions that you've been talking about? Um, I don't know, my mind's gone blank right now. Um, so actually you were talking about quite a lot of um, characteristic indicators of your publisher which is um, Elsevier so that's um, things like the, the the typeface and distinctive layout of the names and so on that's about names isn't it rather than dates and the questions about dates yeah dates I'm not as familiar with I suppose because I've mainly just been looking at um, Sort of yeah, the names on the title pages. But I suppose if we could get, if we could begin to recognise certain printing styles of certain printing houses, which is kind of what I've been trying to do with the Elseviers, and sort of get get to grips and, and get familiar with some um, some of their key styles that they use. If we saw a, a um, title page of an early printed book where the date, um, where the date was questionable we might then begin to be able to sort of trace it back to a particular printing house and kind of go from there. Um, but it's, it's all difficult, uh, you know, it's, it's difficult work and, um, you know, it is, it is hard to sort of trace a lot of these books back to their original places. Great, thanks. It, it involved this incredibly detailed eye for very slight um, differences between lots of different versions of what we would now call the same edition, but with, with slight changes. We've got um, uh, a question from Jerome. By the way, Jerome, thank you very much for your comments on the music. Um, Jerome has two points to say. Um, first of all, that Wettstein is probably an alias, um, as a Wettstein, and I'm probably pronouncing this wrongly, is a word for a lithographer's etching or an engraving stone, and they used um, stones as well as metal. So that's helpful, thank you. And then your question is, have you compared letter sets that they used to determine who printed it, um, keeping in mind that they sold them or rented them out when they wore down? And that's a very interesting point, isn't it? Especially with, um, um, not just with, with type, but with the uh, decoration, and these tended to rotate around printing houses. So um, I don't know, Holly, whether that's anything that you've come across in your work. So. That's a really interesting point, and that's really um, something that I would love to investigate further. Again, I think I'm trying to really have to keep the project sort of, uh, uh, there's so much research I want to do, and, and I'm really having to kind of um, uh, control myself a bit, but that's, that's something that I would love to do some more research into. Um, and yes, they did. I, I have come across some sort of research that does indicate that they did. Um, they did sell letter sets um, and, and things like, you know, printers devices, I think, were used and borrowed by other printers throughout the 17th century as well. Um, so there's definitely more research that needs to do into that area. Um, and hopefully I might be able to, to research a bit more into that at a later time. 
Super, thanks, Holly. Now, we've got more questions, and we'll go ahead with those. But just for those who have to rush off, um, uh, Christopher Fripp has put in the chat on the right-hand side, if you press the pink button to open the chat panel, he's put uh, our email address. So if you've got questions you'd like us to hand on to the speakers today, please email us. So I know we've got a um, couple of people with their hands up, but I'm just going to read out another question from the chat panel because that relates uh, very nicely to what Jerome was saying. Uh, we've got a point here. Thank you both for such interesting presentations. A question for Holly. If the Elzevirs were trying to obscure their responsibility for their books, why did they still include their devices on the title page? Did they expect some people to recognize who made the books from the devices, but other people not to recognize them? And then uh, she's also saying that there's an Amsterdam family of printers called Wettstein. So here we go again with this name. They were active at the beginning of the 18th century, and they also had export links to the UK, especially Ireland. Um, it, also Ireland, I suppose. Um, so maybe that's some relation. Holly, I don't know if you've got anything to say about that. Quite a lot of points. Though. Yeah, thank you. That's uh, really interesting questions. And um, I also didn't know much about the Wettstein um, Amsterdam family of printers. So thank you for, for giving some information about that. Um, in terms of the, uh, the printer's devices, the, so the Elsevier family had a number of different devices that they used. Um, depending very much on the family members um, who were printing at the time. But the sphere that they use, the printer's mark, um, generally they reserved for, for books that were um, of a more sort of controversial nature or um, of, a, of a particular type of sort of dangerous sort of work. So in that case, I think it wouldn't have been as easy for um, authorities or other people to, to track them down and to know exactly who was using, who was producing that work, because as we can see, a lot of other printers in the, in the 17th century did use the sphere as well. So I think that was one way of them, a very good way for them to kind of produce these work but maintain anonymity at the same time. I hope that sort of answers the question. Um, but yeah, so so I think for the kind of work, they didn't use um, the printer's marks that they would normally be using. Um, they sort of used the sphere as a way to to kind of get around that and, and to sort of avoid being identified, I think. Super, thank you, Holly. Um, now, Susan Graef had her hand up and I think her connection has just gone. So if Susan comes, gets back on again, um, we'll ask her question. Um, meanwhile, we've got a point here that says um, there's a project that looked at different types of Milton's Areopagitica, Areopagitica, depending on with your classical pronunciation or early modern pronunciation. So that's uh, one of Milton's works to see who printed it. And Chris Christopher Warren is involved in that. So that's fantastic. And I think you're saying that Jerome Blaines is involved in that as well. Not quite sure. Um, oh, now, Susan, before she left, she did manage to type her point. And she said, um, she says, thank you. And she said that the scientific literature sometimes has false references. Um, so that's interesting as well. Um, now I've got a question uh, which really I think shows up the how impressive these students work is under the current circumstances. Holly, um, what proportion of the books did you actually get to handle um, given the lockdown? Um, none. I don't think I've handled any books at all. No, I no, I didn't. I think this this dissertation project came from uh, developed out of an essay that I wrote for historical bibliography, and I was able to handle a couple of books for that. Um, but I haven't been able to handle any physically. I've been using all digital resources, um, so looking at digital um, title pages online. So it's been very challenging. 
thanks Holly I think you've you've both done an absolutely fantastic job so Holly I think you you will have um, had a look at some of the Miltons that at UCL but um, I really hope for those who are curators who are in the audience that um, after the lockdown that, that the students might have the chance to come and uh, look at look at the physical books this has all been done based on the um, digitization projects and as many of you will know digitization projects of rare books are expensive and time consuming um, so we depend hugely on on funding to do those and this is a really good example at the moment of why that's important a lot of people tend to think that if a rare book is uh, the same edition as another edition we don't really need to digitize it because people focus on digitizing as just a means of reading the words on the page and not only on the page slightly different but we also need to compare very closely as Holly and Will have shown we need to compare um, the very slight differences of one physical edition against another um, one physical copy against another even if they uh, are catalogued as being the same imprint the same state the same edition it's a really good example of why we need to digitize um, so uh, you guys have done a fantastic job. I've got a quick, I've got two quick questions actually. Uh, for anybody in the audience, th is there anybody who has any suggestions about um, the Spinoza, about why those uh, the uh, posthumous works would have been so upfront in print, whereas um, the Tractatus were was um, disguised in so many ways. I don't know if anybody out there um, can click the raise hand button if they have anything to say about that. Just give you a few minutes. And I have another question for the audience. For anybody who is a, a Dutch specialist out there, um, how would a Dutch person have pronounced the French name Jacques? How would a Dutch person have pronounced the, the French name Jacques? Because in early modern England, Jacques would have been pronounced Jacques. In France, obviously Jacques, um, but in Jacques Lejeune, Lejeune um, we're just wondering how a Dutch person might have pronounced that name. So if anybody's got any answers to either of those, do speak up in the chat. Oh, thank you, Jerome. Jerome, do you want to, um, uh, Jerome Blaines, do you want to uh, speak to us with your microphone? We'll see if we can get the microphone to you. Are you there, Jerome? Can you hear me? So that would be Jacques, but most people would say Jacques, exactly like you did. Fantastic, thank you. And would, are you involved in the project that Esther was talking about earlier? No, not at all, not at all. But I'm a, I'm a master craftsman. I'm actually a lithographer, uh, originally, that is. <laughs> Hence that I know a few little things about it, but not that much. Thanks. It was very interesting, uh, by the way. Learned a lot. Well, we've learned a lot from you, Jerome, as well. Thank you for talking about the Redstein. Um, how would you how would you pronounce that word in Dutch? Redstein. It, it just exactly as what you expect uh, a wet stone. It's probably how this particular printer got his name, anyways. Being a printer. <laughs> Fantastic, that's great. Thank you very much. I've seen in the chat that you say that your great grandfather was a Jack as well. Jack, yeah. <laughs> and, and from the same synagogue as uh, as uh, the main figure, <laughs> the main topic. Wonderful. That's just fantastic. Thank you very much for joining us, Jerome. And, um, 
that's one of the great things about these sessions. I remember last year we were looking at some medieval manuscripts and we had a gold leaf illuminator who attended to give us that practical aspect. So that's really fantastic. Um, so I think we're going to wrap up now. It's quarter past two. We have a feedback form which is the link to which is in the chat and it would be wonderful if you could uh, complete that to help us to know how to develop these sessions. It's new to us to run these online. We thank you all very much for joining and please book for the rest of the series. Next week we have uh, more finalists from the Anthony Davis Book Collecting Prize which is open to students at University across London. And we have presentations on collecting black British publishers. Um, and I think next week we have um, Victorian publishers bindings as well. Not They're not publishers bindings, they're actually a little bit later, early 20th century uh, uh, Victorian bindings. Um, the following week we have our own uh, rare books librarian, Chris Fripp, who's going to talk about his um, pretty groundbreaking research on publishers' bindings and on describing cloth bindings in particular, which is something that really hasn't been looked at much um, by rare books librarians, very uh, worthwhile work. And in the final week, we have the rest of the finalists from the Book Collection Prize, and that includes Hungarian illustrated children's books, among uh, other things, um, editions of James Joyce's Ulysses, and so on. So please look for those on Eventbrite. Meanwhile, have a good week and we'll see you next Tuesday. To leave, you press on the left hand icon at the bottom with your head and then press the top right inside that pop up box, leave session. Have a good week.